In this tutorial, we're going to take some cues from the uh, photosurrealist or magical realist uh, photographer Eric Johansson, and um, we're going to work with uh, sort of multiple layers of um, photographs composited together to sort of tell um, some strangely sort of realistic but fantastical uh, stories with our photographs. Now, I will say that the thing that probably makes these things um, the most interesting or the most believable is their sort of emotional content or their conceptual space. Uh, so this, this photograph, for example, is a, an idea I have walking through the woods with my daughter and, um, you know, the, the kind of smallness I feel working, uh, walking through the woods and also seeing the woods through her eyes. And so the idea comes from a sort of experience in reality uh, and then the photographs allow it to be exaggerated. I want you to approach it the same way um, when, you're, uh, when you're kind of compositing or when you're making photographs for this work. Uh, now, that said, I think that it can be sort of overwhelming to look at Eric Johansson's work, just see a lot of overwhelming um, detail and sort of impossible uh, approaches to the sort of digital structure. So let's break this down uh, in maybe like a really basic way. Let's talk about scale or scaling. If you're wondering how to make um, uh, these photographs really come to life and sort of seem sort of fantastical and at the same time uh, real. Uh, consider uh, the sort of dramatic shifts in my perceived scale. Um, so I've got a couple of photographs I'll show you quickly that I use to composite these images and that sort of support uh, my conceptual idea behind the image. Uh, I'll use this photograph uh, taken from behind of my daughter resting her hand on a tree and uh, I need to sort of replace her normal scale with some other uh, massively large scales. I'm being careful to photograph these basically at the same time during the day, that way the lighting is the same. I'm also being careful to uh, photograph these things uh, from, the, uh, from more or less the same perspective. Consider the perspective of um, my daughter with the tree and uh, the same perspective uh, considering scale this way. Now, I'm also doing this um, with the assistance of my daughter, right? So it's all kinds of like photographic mistakes. Um, I'm also dealing with uh, just like smartphone images. I figured I would challenge myself to make these images with, um, uh, with just the camera and my smartphone. And so I've got a, a few hurdles along the way that I'll have to overcome in Photoshop, but the basic pieces are here. Uh, so a photograph, something like this, allows me to sort of maybe select out my daughter. This is going to be a pretty complicated selection, but select out along the edges of my daughter and plop her into an image uh, with dramatically different scales. Now notice I took a few different versions of this photograph uh, to uh, accommodate for different depths of field, different blurs and focus. Um, and I also kind of pulled in a couple of other images that I thought might be useful or fun uh, to kind of work with scale and maybe increase the sort of fantasy or fantastic nature of the images. Uh, things like um, close-ups of other natural growth here or uh, even sort of some textures I might be able to um, lay into certain parts of the photograph. So those are the basic pieces and I'm going to kind of put all those in one folder uh, and slowly start to bring them into Photoshop. Now I'll kind of piece this image apart to kind of show you how all the pieces came together and then I'll uh, start it from scratch. So uh, if I kind of break this all down into its composited chunks, uh, I've got uh, a couple of different layers of uh, photographs of my hand. Now the biggest reason there is um, I uh, was struggling with a couple of things. When you photograph things really close up with a smartphone, uh, the depth of field gets really, really short. So notice I've got a blurry background and a blurry heel and a blurry finger. And the only thing that's in focus is the tip of my boot. Uh, that that's not enough depth of field for me to be able to kind of accomplish what I want to accomplish here. So uh, I ended up having to um, sort of cut in or uh, splice in um, this other uh, this other hand as I was reaching down to the ground uh, using some selections, right? And so uh, one of them allows me to sort of bring an in-focus hand and have an in-focus boot. So I'm already starting to kind of push the limits of uh, what is truthful in terms of like actual photographic, um, forensic photographic fact uh, by, by, uh, by mixing uh, depth of fields. Now notice the, the sort of uh, plants in the back here. This is going to become a bit of a, a problem to have such blurry plants in the background and so I thought well I may be able to actually start to pull in a, um, a third photograph of that background uh, that had a deeper depth of field. Uh, and then I'll just kind of start to blend these seams together. Uh, if you look carefully, you can actually see where the uh, photographic blur and the photographic focus are still not cleanly blended. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of in process on this image and I thought I'd show it to you um, before it was wrapped up. 
then I carefully cut out from the photograph of my daughter leaning up against the tree uh, a selection right around her edge uh, so that it looks like instead of her hand resting on a tree trunk, her uh, hand is resting on the side of a hand reaching down to her. Um, now this is, a, uh, this is a pretty crude cutout so far. I've included some bushes down here at the bottom in that cutout uh, in order to um, uh, in order to kind of sell that kind of reality of her feet actually touching the ground. Uh, I want this to not have that same feel of the cut magazine collage that we did, uh, but to be able to sell a certain amount of photographic realism. Uh, in order to do that, uh, I clearly, even though I photographed these images at the same place in the woods on the same day under the same lighting, uh, there's some white balance differences here, so I had to do some uh, basic exposure control on my daughter. Uh, and then I'm going to begin adding uh, some photographic defects and flaws like vignetting in order to bring my attention to certain parts of the photograph. Um, so this uh, this photograph will sort of start to unfold, um, or I should say this sort of uh, lens-based painting, lens-based art, whatever you want to call it, uh, will sort of come into focus now and really the illusion will be sold in all these kind of like small details I'll add in along the way. But how did I get to this point? Well, let's start this image from scratch and start pulling these images into Photoshop. Now as you're piecing this image together, uh, you're very likely going to have to put at least two or three images together. And um, keep this in mind that Photoshop requires a whole lot of scratch disk space in order just to run. Um, I looked it up one time and I think just to, just to operate Photoshop, just to have it open and running, requires something like 20 gigs of scratch disk space, just free space on your machine in order to operate. Uh, now that's going to increase significantly as you start to open up multiple photographic layers and so you may want you may consider just kind of like shutting down some of your other programs log out of the internet um, just so that your computer doesn't really lag in this process but uh, I'm gonna start by opening up um, one or two of these images of my daughter kind of choose which one I want to uh, work with I kind of like uh, the, her, her pose in this image better so I'll drag and drop that into Photoshop this is not going to cover any like pre-editing that I might do uh, in order to really clean these images up I'm gonna kinda edit them all raw uh, but um, I will say that if you know you started to edit these in black and white or if you wanted to do some color corrections or white balance all that would happen first to these images before you start to work them up this is really more of a, uh, of a kind of lesson in how you might cut images together uh, now, before I get too far into editing this image of my daughter, uh, I'll come down and also open up, I'll make a choice here on which um, which one of these images I will be using. Uh, let's see here, I'm going to go with uh, maybe the most in focus version. There we go. Uh, let's open this image up. So, uh, this is probably the easiest to start thinking about how I might cut out uh, uh, this sort of complex shape of my daughter here and get her plunked into the other image. I'll do my cutting first here in this image, my selections, um, show you how I might refine some of this because it's a really great example of a complicated selection to make. I mean, it doesn't get much more complicated than, you know, my daughter's kind of scraggly hair around the edges of the wood here. So that's where I'll focus this because we've done a fair amount of selection work already and I won't go through the entire selection process here, but I will kind of do at least a um, a quick one and show you how I might refine it. So if I grab my quick select tool, keyboard shortcut for that is W, and uh, I'm going to shrink the brush head uh, so that it's small enough, kind of, I'll do a, a quick pass over her whole figure and then go back in and refine it with smaller and smaller brushes as I go. Uh, a quick reminder about uh, this tool is if I uh, end up making a slight over selection, I'll hold the option key and just sort of remove some of that selection. And uh, I'm looking for um, the sort of contrasty areas. It, this is a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, contrasty edge between my daughter's arm and, uh, and the side of her body here, but uh, it gets increasingly more and more complicated uh, and messy as I go up to the sort of top of her head. And so that's where I'll focus this uh, this sort of refined selection here. If you notice uh, how there are strands of her hair that are overlapping the woods here, and uh, some uh, some of this selection could be sort of brought down more closely to the edges of her head. But uh, there's even this sort of you know I'm starting to see the woods and the sky through some of her hair. This is going to be kind of a um, a messy selection to try to get if I'm just using my quick select tool. So I'm going to need uh, some help, and the help that I'll use is uh, the Refine Edge, or the Select and Mask tool. Uh, I'm going to kind of get it as close as I can here to sort of snap the, the edge of my Quick Select around that, and then grab Select and Mask, uh, 
And I like to view my select and mask options here with overlay. With the red, it makes it really obvious where my selections are. I'll turn on a little bit of edge detection uh, by increasing the radius here. Uh, that sort of starts to blur the edge, uh, but the real power of using this tool is to come over here to the left hand side, uh, what I'll call the hair tool or the refined edge brush tool, keyboard shortcut R, and I'll start to run that brush tool along the edge of the selection to see if I can't pick up uh, a little bit more accurate selection along uh, all of these hairs. Now, uh, realistically, if, if you're really going to sell the illusion here, uh, you're going to have to do a lot of custom brushing. But if I can use the uh, selections to kind of get me close, and I can use the refine edge tool here in my select and mask just to kind of uh, get me started, I'll save a lot of time in Photoshop making these selections. So if you see as I'm brushing along the edge of her hair here, uh, the edge detection tools are finding all these tiny little structures. I mean, we're talking about uh, pixels wide of strands of hair. That would be some really, really detailed picky brushing I don't have to do now because uh, the refined edge tool has helped me out. Now I would probably go around pretty much her entire body in order to clean up this selection uh, and more accurately get it, but uh, for the purposes of this tutorial I just wanted to kind of show you how I would begin uh, to do that basic selection and show you how I would handle a really complicated area. Uh, I still have a, a lot of really messy selection areas here. I would eventually like to pull in some of these bushes, but I'm not going to do all that work right this second. Instead, I'll pull this image uh, into, uh, into the other photograph. Before I do, I'm going to grab a hold of all those selections I made and add that to a layer mask by clicking Add Mask, and it automatically loads her uh, sort of uh, into, this, um, into this mask here. Now I can kind of show and reveal that mask uh, by um, clicking backslash, that sort of shows me where my mask edge is. Uh, I can also right click, disable that layer mask uh, without getting rid of it. And I'm going to use both of those tools as I go here to, um, to, sort, of see, to sort of see where I'm going uh, with all of these overlapping composited images. Now I'll pull her down and sort of float her and drop, drag and drop her into the other layer. Uh, see, she's still coming in with all of her, uh, with all of her other photo backgrounds. Uh, all of that is still with me in this layer here. I'm going to keep her live. That way, um, if I need to kind of pull in some of that other content from this image, I still can. Uh, and I want to kind of do a little bit of manipulating in terms of scale here. Uh, so I'll shrink her down, uh, maybe even rotate her slightly, sort of place her into the image, uh, similar to how I placed her, uh, would place images in uh, using the, um, the sort of cut-paste uh, collage approach of a previous assignment. Now, it looks like in my selections, uh, I've still missed her hand, uh, I've missed her feet, but if I refine those selections carefully enough, I can really get a nice detailed sort of lay of how her hand maybe touches in. And if you notice, uh, it's not perfect, right? I still see along the edges of her hair some bits and pieces, some stray pixels. Uh, but when those um, but when those pixels fall into the other photographs, um, they are uh, they're less likely to be so obvious. And I could always come back in with a brush and refine some of those. Now, using that same approach, I might kind of lay in multiple layers of other objects. Let me jump back into my other photograph here where I have a few more layers built in. Uh, my daughter has uh, a little bit of the ground pulled in with her, and uh, she also has some, some ground pulled in from the back. And uh, I also kind of have photoshopped in or uh, laid in a second hand that's a little bit more in focus. If you think, um, if I go back to my other image here and uh, I sort of take a look at some, what makes this a convincing reality here, it's that um, photographically the foreground is a little blurry, the middle ground is in focus, and the background is blurry. Uh, that's the same way that my eyes work as I kind of move through the world perceptively. And so I want to be able to try to sell a similar idea here uh, where I have uh, similar depths of field running through. Uh, it wouldn't make any sense if my finger was blurry and uh, she was in focus, right? Um, photographically, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't resolve. My perception would tell me that that's inaccurate. Uh, but beyond just getting the images stitched together correctly, there's still um, sort of overlapping image problems here and a, and a few other flaws. Uh, where this image is really going to come to life is when I start to blend in using some shading and some shadows. And I'll do as best as I can kind of yanking in images that are um, each clipped from each other. But at some point, I'll have to merge these images and just start to kind of hand paint them in. Uh, what I think I may do uh, at first here is sort of build in a bit of shading 
to the image itself. So I know that I can kind of merge these two back layers here. Right click, merge. And I would like to kind of lay in just a bit of shading under her hand. Uh, if you take a look at the tree, for example, uh, right under where my daughter is, right, that she kind of throws a little bit of a shadow on that tree in order to make it convincing uh, perceptively that um, that she's actually there in reality. Now, since there was nothing leaning up against my finger here, there's no shadow to draw from photographically, so I'll have to build that. Uh, just in case I really goof this up, I'm gonna do a Command J and duplicate that layer. Oh, but I'll grab a brush. I'm gonna work in black. And uh, brushes, since they work in an additive way, I'll just take that opacity way down and uh, specifically just sort of brush into this image and start to lay in a shadow. And because I'm sneaking it in right under her hand, uh, uh, because I'm drawing it in on this photo layer, it doesn't come in on top of her hand because she's in a separate layer. Uh, now what I probably will do though, uh, is I'm going to work with a selection uh, to kind of mask off where this um, where this shadow will be and where it won't be. Uh, I shouldn't be throwing a shadow up against my boot, I should be throwing a shadow uh, up against um, just, the, uh, just the finger itself. And so uh, in order to kind of work within that selection itself, I'll grab my quick select tool, keyboard shortcut W and grab a quick selection of that edge where the finger is and I'll use a brush to sort of uh, only brush right along the edge of that finger. This doesn't have to be a perfect selection everywhere. I'll turn uh, her back on here so that I can see what I'm doing. Make sure that I'm brushing specifically in this layer. Keyboard shortcut B for the brush and I'll start with a big brush and just sort of pull that shadow straight down. Make a little bit smaller brush, lay it in a little bit closer, uh, lay, it, lay it in darker right where her hand is, a little bit darker. And uh, you can see how um, with, uh, with just a couple of brush strokes, I'm able to lay in something like a convincing shadow that sort of hides right underneath her hand. Now that's not bad. I think I'll probably come back in and just kind of refine that as we go. Uh, but um, but this, is how, uh, this is how I might lay in uh, shadows that are a little bit more convincing. And then uh, if, um, if I wanna actually make that one more on a layer of, of convincing instead of just brushing black into the photograph, uh, I might use a multiply brush mode or an overlay brush mode or a darken brush mode. Um, that way uh, the, the black that I'm painting is actually um, modifying the photographic pixels uh, that are there, not just kind of laying in like a gray on top. Shadows are never really uh, black. What they are is just darker versions of the kind of incident color that's on the skin itself. So here's an example. Uh, I'll just change the blending mode of that brush to, um, let's see here, let's go to darken. And uh, that way I'm working just specifically within the photograph itself. And um, it'll be a little bit more accurate looking shadow. Once I've got those two photographs kind of blended the way I like them again, just for the sake of simplicity, I'll come in and right click and merge those layers again. Uh, this is just gonna help clean up my overall, um, overall space in the image. Uh, it, it's probably not a bad idea to keep those images live, uh, but um, just for the sake of uh, keeping a clean palette, layer palette over here, I'm gonna start merging layers together and, and um, uh, making sure that I don't get too confused. So at this point, I'm starting to kind of play a little bit more with um, the possibility of adding other textures to the space and kind of exciting, uh, you know, this, this sort of very strange transition. This project took a little bit of a turn when 
I realized I wanted to plant the finger into the ground, right? And I had to do a few things to sort of make that um, appear a little bit more, um, uh, appear a little bit more like a smooth blend. I desaturated part of the, the finger here. I tried to bring in a little bit more contrasty finger lines, you know, to make sure that the bark uh, sort of started to transition. But um, then some of these, uh, some of these extra pieces that are, um, uh, textures brought in uh, from uh, from other photographs uh, they really start to get the image to kind of travel uh, this is all still feeling a little bit plain to me but the general gist of the, f uh, the the photograph is present here and it's really starting to kind of devolve into kind of a whimsical magical sort of space um, it's important uh, I think for me to kind of keep considering what's going on out here at the edges of the photograph in order to keep selling the illusion and to keep drawing the eye of the viewer uh, away from the photographic defects and uh, keep selling more and more of the illusion. I'm excited to see what you guys come up with for this project and I'll keep working this one up and show you guys when I'm all finished.